It's one o'clock. Hello. Here we are again with our friend Swami Rama and humanity, humanity, and with the text called, that was my humor, called A Call to Humanity. There it is. A Call to Humanity. And we are in the chapter entitled Religion and Dharma. Pretty interesting stuff. And this, I think, is the third part of that that we've been going through. And I think this shall finish this chapter, I believe. Anyway, so here we go. Fasten your seat belts. Off we go. Vroom. To practice Dharma. We did this paragraph, but I'm going to do this again just because I like it. To practice Dharma, we must grasp. Hello, Michael. We must grasp the essence of all religions rather than merely be entertained by the fascinating stories retold by the preachers down through the ages. All the religions of the world have built castles of mythology. Hi, Mary. But mythology, what a wonderful thing this is. Myth, storyline. I playfully sometimes wonder if in a couple thousand years, the movies that we have now that are the superhero movies, I wonder if they will be looked back upon as being the religions of our age. But, but the reason I say it is because wisdom is easily embedded in movies. Wisdom is embedded in mythology, in stories, storytelling, is a beautiful way. As children, what do you do with children? You give them stories. You read stories to the children, and often those stories have, you know, principles living, wisdom that are contained in there. That's the principle here. Hello, Mary Dell. All of the religions of the world have built castles of mythology. The preachers and priests recite myths as part of their worship and claim that listening to them is a source of spiritual enhancement. Assimilating the morals of those stories rather than merely reacting to them emotionally is the source of spiritual benefit. What does he mean by that? If all we do is go to the movie for its entertainment value, then we're missing something. Hi, Anarud. We're missing something if we just go to the movie often screenplay writers, e even just movies that you and I see from Hollywood that are in the theaters or, or on the Netflix or whatever, often they embed nice messages in there. And so instead of just emotionally reacting to the movie, assimilating the morals of those stories, what Swamiji says here, rather than merely reacting to them emotionally is the source of spiritual benefit. And so we draw the benefit by listening carefully to the storylines that are in their books or in their Bibles or whatever you want to call them. A religious principle must have its root in divine revelation. Somebody has an aha as they're writing the story down or making the movie. An aha comes and says, and you know, a team is working, how would we say so-and-so? Well, and let's have this character say, boom. And, and you're scripting something, you're creating. A religious principle must have its roots in divine revelation. Religious doctrine originating from mere intellect is of little value. A doctrine that cannot uplift our souls, directing our thinking toward the divine and inspire us to act for the welfare of human beings should be questioned, analyzed, and reformed. In order to practice true dharma, hi, Susan. In order to practice true dharma, one must surrender one's ego to the higher reality. One must transform one's thinking process and must purify one's mind and heart. The purpose of dharma is to move closer to God by removing the wall of ego-born alienation. Hi, Mike. 
A follower of Dharma strives to see truth, auspiciousness, and beauty in all living beings. That realization is called self-realization, enlightenment, or divine experience. Think back at just what, what we just went through. There's such tremendous wisdom in here about how to relate to these stories. But most of us need to ponder this over and over and over again. And gradually the wisdom of even what we're reading here sinks in. This is why I sometimes say when we go through these things, listen for one little gem that it, for you today is a takeaway. So you can implement that into your own contemplations. Today in all religions of the world, the shining gems of truth have been shrouded under superstition, blind faith, and dogma. It's there, but it's been shrouded. Human beings today are afflicted with a terrible sense of insecurity, fear, and mistrust. The Dharma of the sages can help resolve these psychological and spiritual disturbances. The Dharma of the sages is simple, but experiential. However, the people not committed to the practice and without experience consider it to be mysterious. In fact, there is no mystery, no secrecy in Dharma. The mystery lies in our over the mystery lies in our overly analytical minds. I meet people who have incredible intelligent minds, but we can overdo it. And the mystery is behind that. Overly analytical minds lost in complicated practices that fail to recognize the profundity of, get ready, simplicity. I'll read that again. The mystery lies in our overly analytical minds lost in complicated practices that fail to recognize the profundity of simplicity. The Dharma of the sages gives one a higher view of life that is not confined to the physical body or worldly objects alone. What do you think of that? I had company here, but he ran away. According to awesome. the... According to this, this is what we were talking about. According to this Dharma, one must rise above the charms and temptations of the world to employ one's resources in the realization of the truth, the source of eternal peace. One must realize the truth in its totality and perfection. Good tag, Hashim. Hashim must be in his little basket thing there, huh? Swinging. Trust, truth is more than the known and unseen aspects of our life and its related objects. Truth exists in all times and places. Truth can be experienced within the depth of one's own being. One can penetrate the various layers within and become one with truth through a systematic practice. Belief in truth is certainly better than disbelief, but it is the practice of truth that can transform one's belief into a creative and joyous experience. The sages who experienced and became one with the truth realized that all of humanity is one family. According to the Upanishads, all of creation is a family spiritually enriched with humanitarian ethics is the inner breath of the Upanishads. Such high ideals are seldom found in any religion of the world. In the future, if humanity ever tries to establish a universal religion, it will be based on the profound teachings of the Upanishad. And here he's talking about the principles that are there. It doesn't mean that we all have, to, all have to say now everybody is converting to the new religion called Upanishad Church or something like that. That's not the point. 
I long for the day when humanity will evolve and will adhere to the higher principles of Dharma. He's noting there for himself in his own life, but so far he has not seen this in humanity because he longs for the day where humanity will evolve and then will adhere to these higher principles. According to the Upanishads, there is only one truth called Brahman, or simply one, O-N-E, or many other names, sometimes God. This word God is, for most people, is most commonly used to refer to a being, most usually a him who is in some other place, and he is there and we are here. That's one of the usages of the word God. But another usage of the word God that often is ignored is the one that says it's simply a label, a, a label, a name, not a proper name like the name of a person, but is a word that is a symbol for that one absolute non-dual infinity that is a stream of life and consciousness. And that can be called God. So which way are we using the word God? But according to the Upanishads, there is only one truth called Brahma. And that's why I pause to say, or whatever we want to call it. The truth is omniscient and omnipresent. From a spiritual standpoint, the non-dualistic statement, all this is Brahman, is not merely a philosophical doctrine. Rather, it is a matter of experience. And each of us gradually can come to see the, the obvious nature of this thing. That as we look around, there is obviously only one reality. Everything out here is part of one existence. Relatively speaking, my little laptop computer sitting right here exists. The chair that it's sitting on exists. The chairs over there exist. I exist. The book exists. The building I'm sitting in exists. The planet Earth that I'm sitting on exists. The sun outside that I look at in the sky exists. Everywhere I look, whatever I consider, this quality of existence itself is there. All this is Brahman is not merely a philosophical doctrine. Rather, it is a matter of experience. And by doing our own contemplations along these lines, we come to gradually see for ourselves that this is utterly obvious that there is only one reality. And for convenience sake, one of the words for that is Brahma. If, re, if you prefer and, and choose to use it in the way we're talking about, we can use the word God, but not meaning the him who's up there in the sky. It's this one infinite, absolute, non-dual reality, and you and I experience this. And all, in some sense, the simplicity of this, he said a moment ago that there is a simplicity to this. The simplicity of this is to practice this by observing the world around us and we see for ourselves. And it's not a philosophy. It's not subject to debate. We don't have to argue about which religion is right and which is wrong. All I have to do is look at the world around me and it is self-evident that there is only one existence. That's what we're saying here. In addition, from an ethical standpoint, it provides a ground for cultivating an attitude of universal brotherhood. It, note the choice of words here. It provides a ground for cultivating an attitude. It, it's not the attitude, but it cultivates, it opens the door. It cultivates a ground for you and I to gradually see, wait a minute, there is a universal brotherhood, a universal sisterhood, because there's only one. We see that. This, uh, this statement helps one instill in one's mind the feeling, instills a feeling that this whole world is a family. It's a feeling. Now, we all know that we don't live in that way. We live that this is me and my people, my ethnicity, my family, my country, my religion, my school, on and on like this. We don't live like that. There's mine and there's the other. But here he's suggesting that this helps instill in our mind the feeling awareness that maybe this whole world is a family. By considering all humanity to be one's family, 
one rises above mutual differences. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean that I forget the fact that I am here and there's my friend Hashim there. He's sitting in his house a long way away from here. And I know that I am me and Hashim is Hashim and there's Mike and there's Susan and there's Anarud. And yes, we're individuals. Even Meridel is her own individual. Hi, Meridel. And, and, and we can see the individuality, but yet there's this underlying feeling and we start to rise above the sense of differences. Of course, there is a difference between me and you, but at the same time, we're getting an increasing feeling that there really is true, that there's only one, and that I as a person and a body and a personality and a mind and an ego, I arose out of that one. And so that one who arose out of that one is actually not who I am. I am qualitatively that out of which I came. Qualitatively, I am the ocean, but I have arisen out of the ocean as a wave. So am I a wave in the ocean? Well, yes. Am I a wave? Yes. Am I a wave? No, actually, you're not a wave, says wisdom to myself. No, actually, you are the ocean. You're not the whole ocean, but qualitatively, you are ocean. And we just keep doing reflections like this in our own lives, in our own house, in our own city, in our own country, in our own profession, in our own world. And we just keep doing that kind of thing over and over and over again. And that's an important part of contemplation. And then sometimes we sit on our butt and just recede everything inward to attempt to find that inner center. And that's called meditation. So meditation and contemplation are companions. We don't do one or the other, do both. In order to attain freedom and bring about peace and harmony, harmony to our society, we must respect only those principles that are based on direct experience of the truth. Doesn't mean we can't learn principles by doing what we're here, reviewing books and texts and wisdom of others who have come before us. We must disregard the doctrines that deter us from the path of enlightenment. If, if you're running, call, if said crudely, call bullshit. When you see something that sounds off, just don't, no need to fight it, but we can just, you know, that's just not where I'm going. I'm not going into that. I'm, I'm basing this on what have I experienced. So when I say look around the world and see that everything has existence, don't take my word for it. Don't take Swami Rama's word for any of this. Run your own experiment. And then it's not doctrine. No matter how charming and sweet a doctrine is, it is useless if it does not help us become more creative and useful for ourselves and for others. There is no hope of attaining peace unless we start living a wholesome life. A wholesome lifestyle does not consist of becoming emotionally attached to the superficial values of religion, not attached to the superficial values. What difference does it make if one worships God wearing white clothes or red clothes or any other sort of example? The true atheists are those who criticize others while claiming to be believers in God. Listen to that. That's a very strong statement, isn't it? And you and I get to ponder that and see if we hear the wisdom of what he's suggesting or if we think, no, I just disagree with that, and that's okay too. The true atheists are those who criticize others while claiming to be believers in God. Dharma is that which can be practiced by all and which can bring a qualitative change in individual and community life. Such a dharma is an eternal friend, since it is always there in times of need. Such a dharma helps us attain the summum bonum of life, both here and hereafter. It is the duty of mankind to practice and defend such a dharma, not the sectarian beliefs that create bitterness among human beings. Hmm. Food for thought once again, isn't it? This text here is loaded with food for thought, isn't it? One may, one may ask, what are the signs and symptoms of Dharma? The answer is that which has no room for narrow-mindedness, sectarianism, blind faith, and dogma 
is the true Dharma, that which has direct experience as its source, but welcomes logic and reasoning is true Dharma, a spiritual path that does not prom promise heaven only after death, but that helps the aspirant to create a heavenly atmosphere wherever he is, is true Dharma. More food for thought, huh? One must not be afraid to follow such a Dharma, or at least must not be afraid to absorb the higher qualities of universal Dharma into his religious background. The truth resides in those hearts where selfless love has found its way. True joy follows from the center of love, and the purpose of life is to allow that love to flow throughout. Hi, Nelly. Hi, Matesh. When true love flows from the heart, one learns how to give and share without any expectation. Both the lover and the beloved are transformed through the force of love. In fact, selfless love and dharma are one and the same, since love is the inherent quality of the soul. We become true followers of dharma when all of our activities are determined by the force of truth and love. Ordinarily, people are not aware of the true nature of dharma, but are caught in a net of religious knavery. Therefore, to ask them to reconsider and critically analyze the dogmas and practice of their religious traditions is intellectually upsetting. This seems to be an understatement. It could truly be upsetting to suggest that. The intellectual class of our society is not happy with its religious environment. However, it remains involved in the so-called religious activities, for it has not yet found an alternative. There is nothing wrong with the essence of any religion. The problems are created by the preachers who claim to be custodians of the religion. Why there is so much contrast between theory and practice is a matter of serious consideration. It appears that in a great it appears that to a great extent our present system of education is responsible for this problem. Today every human being tries to choose a lifestyle that pleasures him. He wants to follow his own unique path. He disregards the wisdom of the past and considers that disregard to be freedom of thought and freedom of conduct. Human beings are fond of experimenting with new values, modes of conduct, standards, and lifestyles, but these experiments lack a sound philosophical foundation. Consequently, the trend is to move in diverse directions and arrive at conflicting conclusions. A human being should understand that his life must not be governed by selfishness or inactivity. No matter which kind of lifestyle he chooses, he must not allow anti-humanitarian thoughts to invade his life. Most of humanity is practicing one religion or another, yet one's worldview is confined to his own sectarian beliefs, customs, and dogmas. Ignorantly, one considers one's own convictions to be the highest religion and thus fails to think of the welfare of all of humanity. Evidently, human beings have defined religion as victory over external objects through possession. The greatness of religion is evaluated on the basis of the wealth and material objects possessed by its temples, churches, or clergy. Human beings are busy collecting the things that make them physically comfortable and enable them to lead luxurious lives. An unending desire for more has become the driving force of mankind. 
one part of our society has ignored the importance of divine dharma <coughs> and as a result is suffering from its own blind faith and dogmas. Almost every human being is religiously ill and those who claim to be the healers of such diseases are even worse. Another segment of society focuses on technological achievements and material force. The members of this part of society are trying to govern nature. They believe that nature will function under their command. Both groups have forgotten the eternal law of nature, the eternal law of truth. Both, of, both those who believe in a religion and those who do not are equally distanced from true dharma. Neither is able to realize the purpose of human life. Neither has time to contemplate and decide which path to choose, which way to go, which to look, what to look for, and ultimately how to attain eternal peace. According to the wise, knowledge alone is not enough. Knowing about Dharma by itself may not lead one to work for the welfare of all. Sometimes, sometimes great thinkers and idealists do not lead others to be productive. Such philosophers are absorbed in the process of thinking, considering thinking alone to be the highest form of Dharma. They separate themselves from the rest of society and are unfamiliar with the needs and necessities of their fellow beings. Such thinkers, therefore, also fail to understand the current situation in their society. Thus, their teachings may be philosophically and doctrinally sound, but practically not very useful. A thinker must maintain a universal attitude. He must think of the welfare of all and must look at the applicability of his theories. Only then will he succeed in offering the gems of true dharma to his contemporary fellow beings. For ages, our thinking processes have been modulated by a pre-existing belief that did not allow us to think independently. Relying on dogmas, human beings became weak. Through their own weakness, they accepted the superiority of blind customs, superstitions, and hypocrisy instead of real dharma. With the passage of time, they forgot dharma and replaced it with superficial norms and customs. This circumstance is more evident today than ever before. The following are some of the essentials of dharma. Now he enumerates 12 different principles here. It's a pretty rich bunch of stuff here. One, Practicing dharma means maintaining God consciousness through every activity in life. One accepts God as the supreme principle and allows his individual life to be led in the light of God consciousness. Accepting God means tr allowing truth and discrimination to guide all activities of life and consequently attaining freedom from selfishness weakness, lack of discrimination, desire, and anger. The essence of dharma lies in practicing morality. The more we purify ourselves, the closer we move to dharma. And once again, he uses this word God. He says God consciousness. And he says uses the word God as supreme principle. Note, he's not saying that our God is right and their God is wrong, and our God is a him who is over there. It's this nature of dharma and the consciousness within. Two, essentials of dharma. Number two, there is no need to teach a new dharma. Rather, the need is to purify one's life and make it truth-oriented. 
the method of purification must be in accordance with one's innate tendencies and inner inclinations. Dharma consists of making oneself pure in thoughts, speech, and actions. Cleanliness, contentment, and morality are the signs of adhering to Dharma. Number three, Dharma should be practiced in every aspect of life. The highest good lies in reaching the center, the Atman, and finally experiencing the oneness of the Atman and the supreme truth, Brahma. First seek to know Atman, the center of consciousness, and then comes the part of realizing that this Atman that is the center of me, that is me, that that is literally one with the Brahma. That's the first know myself as a wave of water and then come to wake up to the fact that I am a wave and that I am the infinite ocean. In order to maintain the highest good, one passes through various stages of spiritual awareness. First, the seeker attains knowledge through constant practice and contemplation. Constant. The knowledge is assimilated and then becomes an inseparable part of one's being. The strength gained through knowledge helps one become overcome blind faith in dogmas. One attains pure faith and surrenders oneself to the divine fourth force once and forever. Number four, Dharma protects the individual as well as societies. Whenever materialism tries to swallow humanity into its ever-growing thirst for the accumulation of worldly riches. Therefore, ethics and politics based on Dharma alone can, can be beneficial for human beings, for human gro growth. Number five. Today, Politics has separated itself from Dharma and thereby has created chaos in our society. We must uplift ourselves. We must not allow human values to be undermined. This is possible only if we can bring Dharma into our day-to-day -day lives. Number six, Dharma protects human beings from becoming lost in the material world. It reminds the aspirants of the importance of spiritual life by pointing out the transitory nature of the objects of the world and the sense pleasure derived from them. With the, with the decline of Dharma, the ugly forces of selfishness, egoism, violence, prejudice, and discrimination invade our minds and hearts. Do not let those demonic forces plunder your peace of mind and hinder your growth. Number seven, Dharma means discovering love, truth, and peace in one's life, and these discoveries contribute to the fulfillment of individuals as well as to humanity as a whole. It is good to contemplate upon the divine, but living the life of a philosopher while escaping from one's duties and wandering hither and thither without organizing one's life cannot be condoned. Such researchers of the truth contribute nothing to the welfare of others. The practice of Dharma begins with one's individual life, but ends in the collective life of all mankind. An aspirant withdraws himself from worldly affairs, not as an escape, but rather with the intention of managing his time and energy for higher achievements. Once he attains this, he goes back to the world and shares the fruits of his achievement with the rest of humanity. Number eight. The sense of security is the mother of peace. Human beings cannot achieve that security by competing for material wealth or by achieving endless successes in the field of science and technology. For true security and peace of mind, 
we have to attain mastery over ourselves rather than over external objects. Number nine, the awareness of Dharma comes from the realization that the stream of life is not confined to this known part of our being. The stream of life originates from the divine, which is higher than or superior to human life. By realizing this truth, a sincere seeker of Dharma casts off his ego and starts experiencing the oneness of the life force within all beings. Such an aspirant never considers any sectarian belief to be higher authority than the truth, big T truth. Number 10, today we need a path of discipline to help us maintain the peace and happiness usually compromised by disease, old age, and the fear of death a path that helps us re remain unperturbed by such afflictions as disease, old age, and death is the dharma of mankind. Only such a dharma can help us live in the world and yet remain unaffected. 11. There was a time when the sentiment, this is mine and that is yours, was an attitude of those with little minds. For a person with high character and a broad mind, this whole world is a family. Such a humanitarian or egalitarian attitude is the ethical aspect of Dharma, whereas the direct experience of the non-dual truth is the spiritual foundation of the perennial Dharma. Whenever humanity is ready to set forth a universal religion, it will have to return to the gems of truth from the Vedas and the Upanishads that long ago declared the whole world is one family. And it doesn't mean that they all have to convert and say, now I am a, I'm a, a Veda religion person. It doesn't mean I have to go to the Upanishad church. It's the principles here that are important. So that's why you and I hang out with this stuff and then we can evaluate them for ourselves. Hello, Urban and we can internalize them, and then we live the principles ourselves. Here's number 12 on the principles of Dharma, and this, this closes this chapter on religion and Dharma. Pretty good stuff, isn't it? Number 12, Dharma is pure in itself. The purity of Dharma cannot be compromised with sectarianism. A sectarian religion is open to a limited group of people whereas Dharma embraces all and excludes none. Remember, the chapter was on Dharma and religion. So isn't that a fascinating, wonderful conclusion there? A sectarian religion is open to a limited group of people, where, whereas Dharma embraces all and excludes none. Okay, so that's the end of this journey together through religion and Dharma. Next. Next will come a section or chapter on sadhana. And this, so, so we've talked about all this. So sadhana is now, okay, what do I actually need to do? Sadhana means practices. So what do I actually need to do? All to be continued. Thank you for visiting and playing. I hope this is fun. I think it is. And as you often hear me say, my hope is that there was some little gem in what we went through today that catches your attention and that goes with you and that you incorporate into that character called you, which, of course, you call me. But not me, me, you, me. <laughs> anyway, to be continued, huh? Thank you for playing. I hear that goddess voice off in the distance saying, Swamiji, push the button. I have to push it twice, button number one. And then let us just drift off into some internal sense of the universal dharma that is one. And where do we find that? In the silence that is to be found 
after an ohm.